My name is Jim Robb, and I'm president of the National Training and Simulation Association, otherwise known as NTSA. For those new to NTSA, we are a nonprofit association dedicated to facilitating dialogue between government, industry, and academia on topics related to providing the best possible training and training systems for our warfighters and first responders. We host a portfolio of nine events each year, the last of which is called IITSIC, which is the largest training and simulation conference in the world. We invite you to that, it's gonna be great. Today's topic uh, is a journey in our discovery and debate about the metaverse. Uh, today we'll emphasize discussions about open standards and applica applications toward the military metaverse, which is something that we're driving to uh, from the commercial side. Uh, this session will discuss ongoing efforts of creating open standards for the metaverse and how they apply to gaming, exercise, modeling, simulation uh, use cases. Uh, we'll also discuss the impact of geospatial data and a lot of the back end that's going to empower the metaverse, especially in the military environment. Uh, we'd also like to thank Deloitte for supporting today's event. And if you'd like to sponsor uh, one of our webinars, please uh, look at the website. So now let me just introduce Jen Arnold, who's our uh, moderator for today's event. She's gonna tell you a little bit more about what she does at NVIDIA, but Jen's an all-star in the ITSA community. She's a prior conference chair. She's a serious, uh, volunteer for us, and, and she's really a great thought leader, in uh, certainly in the metaverse uh, kind of areas. So we're honored to have you with us today, Jen, and, and over to you. Admiral, thank you so much. As you know, this topic is near and dear to my heart, and the group of leaders, thought leaders that you see in front of you today are top of the game in metaverse topics. So I just wanna start off by saying we're thrilled to be here. Um, and moving forward, we're very excited about continuing the discussion. Today is our first step of bringing some of these topics to you, but we fully intend to have this discussion between now and definitely at ITSIC. There's a number of special events that are part of the next big thing that many of you or all of you should be aware of. So we look forward to meeting you in person. So please find us as well as these events that I discussed at IITSIC. Uh, to get together and to continue the conversation. There is so much ahead of us. Uh, as we all know, the metaverse has been around for 30 to 40 years, uh, yeah. but now is the time. And we are very excited to bring these topics to you today. So make it interactive. You've got your chat. We're gonna have uh, time for Q&A at the end, but please start putting your questions in now. We received a number of great conversation questions from you beforehand. Uh, but please work with us to make this interactive and ask your questions. With that, I'd like to introduce one of the thought leaders in the metaverse, Ms. Nadine Alama, CEO and president of the Open Geospatial Consortium. Nadine, over to you, please. Thank you, Admiral, and thank you, Gustav. Um, so, uh, an honor to be your sidekick or your partners um, for this webinar. Um, what is OGC since, you know, uh, I'm, hello everybody, and yes, we are looking for the end of November. So OGC is uh, that you probably know from our Jews around for more than 28 years. Spatial data, which you will see, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable. Uh, in the meantime, just witnessing our ships between public private and academic gonna come together uh, in the matter. Introduce me as the CEO of OGC, some, you know, better uh, the geospatial wing here. I'm cheering for geospatial. So, uh, <laughs> Jen, do you want me to um, sort of set the stage? 
<laughs> Absolutely, Nadine. Why don't we just dive right on in on all the great work that you're currently doing? All right. So, uh, Nadine, Nadine before, yes. we, before we do that, your audio, we might need to bring yes. your audio down just a little bit. We're getting just a little bit of feedback. All right, is this something? Is this try that. better? Is this better? Uh, it's not quite. Uh, it not quite. Can, maybe if you drop your audio, can you pull your audio down just a little bit? That might be helpful. All right, it's dropped it. Let's see, let's try that. I can. Need it? You know, somebody recommended that you might turn yes. it off and turn it back on. Let's try that. Turn it off. Turn it back better. No, it's still not quite there yet. Let's see. Or it's some more. Is this any better? No, it's not, Nadine. I'm sorry. It might be a Bluetooth issue. Is it possible to um, cut your AirPods? Without the AirPods? Ready? Ready. Ready. All right. Can you hear me better? Yes. Let's... It's a little better. It's a little better. All right. Should I go? So, but it's not, it's apparently not changing. I'll just stay away from my laptop into my room, <laughs> into the metaverse. So speaking of the room, I'm just gonna, because to me it's the mandatory kids slide in every presentation. I think we're learning so much from on, on what the metaverse is. And honestly, when we had our first uh, calls a while back just like hey what's the metaverse that me a picture of my son last night German game on the PS5 and amazing but what I tell him is imagine this with real buildings real cars real obstacles, real, and I think you'll see when I, when you're, why I'm Amphis Gesto and Shazan start to show you real data, you'll get this, this, and where we are. Um, the other thing, just, so this is actually me, I don't know if you can, Standing there in the middle of the experiment that we did last year. Uh, but I got put in the product. And this was happening in New York while physically being so guitar. It was me talking to the camera. And again, we emphasize the real. It's actually real. Intervene is a real object. You can interact under you. What's around you Maybe. is yes. Um, I'm going to pause you there. Everyone is very excited about what they're seeing, um, but you're still sounding like you're underwater. So why don't we pause you? Because I, I I know everyone wants to see this content. Why don't, if you don't mind, can you exit out, come back in? Gasto, why don't we go to you and then we'll go to you and then we'll come back. Hey, Jen, can you hear me okay? You sound perfect. And you've got Great. control of the slides. All right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Gaston de Figueredo. I run strategic partnerships for BlackShark.ai. 
And I've been around the industry for a fair amount of time with companies like Sun Microsystems, Apple, and then Microsoft. Um, so um, I'm going to skip some slides here, but I uh, trust me that there is a, a, a method to the madness and that we actually created a, a logical progression here that I'll let Nadine cover. But Nadine is going to touch on the fact that um, creating the metaverse involves some sort of a representation of the real world. And that representation can be done in a variety of ways. Um, for example, our approach is to extract data from the surface of the planet using AI, starting from satellite and aerial imagery, and reconstruct this in 3D representations through a vector representation in what we call a geotypical environment. Um, environments like these have a number of use cases. Um, you've probably seen our content displayed in Flight Simulator, the Microsoft game, but we also apply this towards modeling simulation environments. But one of the key aspects that, um, that we've been working on in this approach is to enable a semantic representation, meaning for every pixel, for every aspect that you see in the image, there is data about that that can be used and consumed by the simulation environment, by the users for a particular application. So in this scenario, a street scene that we reconstructed out of Paris, you can turn on layers that represent walkable or drivable surfaces. In this case, um, there is a data layer that is accessible by applications uh, that can use in in this environment to indicate where it's a where a particular actor may drive or walk or even expose materials um what are things made of in this um, synthetic world is this concrete or glass or shingle um or brick which then um these properties can be carried through a different set of applications so that they can benefit in, in their simulation um, by the knowledge of what they're interacting with. So in, in the example of, uh, of a simulation environment, in a traditional case, these things were built in a monolithic way, the same application that is providing the physics environment, the simulation, say, of flight or a weapon system or a car or whatever, the aspect may be, had to encode all of these properties by, uh, by themselves. Um, and what we're enabling here, and one of the big points of the conversation today across the board is that there are ways where you can do this, where people can concentrate on their specific area of expertise, whether it be the physics of flight or um, creating uh, the um, learning and training environment and rely upon um, data that's available through other mechanisms to represent the world and its, um, its material attributes. And I'm gonna pause here for a second. Nadine, you're back. Can, you, can we audio check and see how you're doing? Uh, this is a test. All right. All right. So cool. I'm gonna rewind and let Nadine tell her part of the story. Oh, you don't have to. I'm I'm enjoying this. <laughs> this is great. This is this is what I was talking about. So apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, I was enjoying just like listening to Gesto providing what I was talking about. Real, real examples with real data with real use cases. And I think going back, Jen, you know, my partner in crime, when we were talking about the metaverse is not just uh, the hype. It's not just the NFTs. Uh, it's not just the cool stuff. Um, and it's being essentially what we've been working on for the last 30 to 40 years, you mentioned, uh, between geospatial, between AI, between cloud, between graphics. So I think we're, you know, I honestly, we're finally there in a way. So to many of us, it's not this new thing. It's the culmination of what we've been working on for a long, long time. And I think Jen said it already and Gustav said it and Neil will definitely say it again. 
um, it's becoming so big, right? It's this massively distributed environment, this uh, 4D immersive environment, this multiplayer environment, all of this together uh, that nobody can do it alone, right? And I think probably if there's one message out of this whole thing is this message. That's why we need to talk about it and we need to work together on it. Um, so for this, I will say I can share a video later with you to see how you can be immersed in the metaverse that Gustav and Shizan are actually building. Um, but uh, I go back to what we're doing here, that we're onto something. Um, and what we're actually doing is blurring the lines between reality and the synthetic environment. And that's what we did together uh, at the SIGGRAPH course a month ago. I think it's definitely worth checking out if you haven't already. Uh, Cesium and the Metaverse Standards Forum actually compiled that whole course in a nice blog with all the presentations. Highly, highly recommended uh, to check it out. And we would be happy to put the link in the chat. So, yes, for us geospatial people, um, uh, we can bring all of our knowledge of geospatial into the metaverse. So we, when we talk the metaverse is geospatial, we're talking 3D, and you've seen hints of it already from Gastel, but the 3D tiles uh, that was led by Cesium, streaming massive 3D geospatial content, right? Uh, having these this bounding box hierarchy where you can call out large portions of the data, progressively refine the content. As you get closer, that's that's geospatial. That's what we do. The I3S from Esri, same thing. Seen layer standard. You know, millions of discrete 3D objects and their attributes. So that semantics, it's gonna you're gonna hear it as well from Gastel and Chazan at the same time. But that's a lot of data. The idea is, and it's a lot of geospatial data when you want to bring in the environment around you. And that's why, you know, I think what we've been doing in geospatial, what we've been doing with standards in geospatial is actually so, so critical for this uh, scalability and performance of the metaverse. Um, the streaming, the caching, but also this, um, you know, what we've done, I think, collectively as geospatial people of representing the real world in models, whether it's the city GML or city JSON, whether it's modeling our infrastructures, um, the underground infrastructure, the water models, the pipeline models, augmented reality, indoor models, there's so much. And that's why I keep saying, you know, this is not Hollywood. What you see is actually bringing the real world. That's the blurring between the reality and the synthetic. That's providing an environment that as real and as up to date and as live as possible so that we can interact with it even separately. And you're gonna hear a lot about the semantics because I think part of it, that's when we call real, it's not just the shape of a tree or the shape of an airport. It's every attribute and the relationship between, you know, an airport and the surrounding features. That's the semantics, which, again, Gusta will tell you more about. So the idea is you get immersed in all this data. And that's what we're bringing as geospatial people. And... Um, you know, trying to make it accessible, as I mentioned earlier, when I was underwater, that was maybe in the metaverse. You don't know. <laughs> um, but the whole idea is eventually, it's not a system. Uh, it's beyond, in my mind, even a system of systems. But what we need to make sure of is that all the data and all the elements can actually connect. And the way they connect, what we're contributing from the geospatial angle, which is one of many, as you'll hear from Neil shortly, is this ability to make the data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. So that's, you know, APIs and web services and just simplifying that whole access. And just to, you know, seed this in your heads before uh, the conference, before the rest of this presentation is the metaverse, it's, it's hard to define, but we have the elements of it. So yes, we say the metaverse is geospatial, but it's not just geospatial. And I think we, we all will say it over and over again. 
No one can do it alone. So we have to collaborate. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel because we want to get to the good stuff, the use cases, the value, the impacts. And I think that's why we need the standards and that's why we need the systems to interoperate. And last but not least, before I hand it back to Gesto, it's not a one-time thing. It's definitely not a one-time thing. That's why we need to keep experiments. And I think we need to keep experimenting together. And once again, if you come to the conference at the end of, the, of November, uh, you'll see the experimentations happening on the exhibit floor. I witnessed them myself last year and it was amazing. And I, I'm expecting like 10 times as much this time. Uh, so maybe with that, Gesto, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Nadine. And yes, so we were talking about representing the world in attributes. And we have one approach that, as I mentioned, we start from satellite or aerial, and we start from very large. So we have processed the entire planet. Um, and, and that scale can be used in a variety of scenarios. But there are scenarios where a difference of scale is warranted. Um, and with that, I would hand over to my partner in crime, Shazan, here um, to talk about a different approach. Thanks, Kesso. Uh Before I jump into it, quick introduction for myself. Uh, uh, my name is Shazan Mohammed. I lead 3D engineering and ecosystems here at Cesium. Um, so I've, I've really seen the evolution of how uh, 3D data is being collected and disseminated over the you know, past few years uh, and really seen how 3D tiles as a standard has helped uh, facilitate some of that. What we've essentially seen is that more, more and more data is being captured um, across the world, not just urban areas. We're also seeing rural areas or oceans and cities and other things being captured faster, more frequently, and by more people. Um, an example of this is, for example, Gestao showed how satellite imagery can be used to generate content. But also all of you who own a more recent iPhone have a LiDAR sensor in your, in your phones. You could capture your house, for example, in complete 3D. So the, the democratization of how our world is captured is really happening. So in addition to that, what we're also seeing is advanced AI algorithms and other processes being able to classify vast amounts of 3D data into semantic information. Just I showed a fantastic example of how roads and buildings and can be classified. What you have on the screen is another way of classification where um, you're not just limiting yourself to, to let's say the whole building uh, as classified as one, but really as Gaston suggested that every pixel in your image of your data needs to have some semantic information about what that is. So, so over the last year and a half, we've been updating the 3D tile standard to be able to take advantage of this metadata. Um, so for those of you who may be new, 3D tiles is a standard uh, com OGC community standard for the efficient dissemination rendering of uh, heterogeneous 3D geospatial data through a hierarchical level of detailed spatial index. So coming back to the metadata itself, um, you, you may ask, okay, what can I do with this metadata? If I know where my road is, if I know where my buildings are, if I know what material my building is made out of and where the windows are and stuff, what can I do with it? And, and I'll just through, run through some examples that we love sharing, but what we are gonna see is that you, the audience and the, the community are gonna come up with so many new stuff that we haven't imagined ourselves. So some examples are selecting different parts of the building um, or trees or roads, be, uh, understanding where pedestrians, both uh, you know, human control avatars or uh, characters, as well as non-player entities can walk down the street. Um, you can take those materials and edit them. So for example, you see some trees uh, down by the roadside. What if you're able to remove those trees and as Nadine suggested earlier, be able to replace them with beautiful uh, computer-generated or model trees uh, in a game engine. Another example could be uh, making windows translucent. When you capture windows through photogrammetry, uh, most of those are going to be opaque. But if you could identify where the window is, change the material of it so that it's now transparent, 
you can look through the building and become more immersive. Um, knowing which side the door opens, for example, is going to be great for simulation and training. Um, if if a door swings open the wrong way, the, our, our training and simulations are going to suggest that we go in through a different direction. Um, and finally, RF propagation and, and 5G are a big thing. If, if you're mounting these billions of dollars of uh, 5G hardware across our cities, being able to simulate so that we have maximum uh, coverage of our signals um, is also going to be is also going to require planning and material information and RF propagation is going to uh, significantly help with that. So all of these capabilities are only going to make our worlds richer and more immersive. Um, so, so what we are now seeing from that small example is we have to apply this to the entire world. Um, it's it's a massive challenge in scale. And we have to apply it not just for everything that's visible, for example, our sky to ground, but we also have to apply it to underground uh, capabilities, our pipelines, um, our utilities, and, and such. And even for undersea, we, we want to make sure that we are capturing our, our oceans and seafloor as well. And you're going to need a lot of AI and a lot of compute to be able to do that. And as we scale the AI across the world, we're going to be applying to different types of objects, from buildings and Ferris wheels like you see in this image, to roads, sidewalks, trees, parks. And no single company is going to be able to meet all of those demands. We have to work together in different ways. And there's not going to be one way to classify all of these things either. Um, what, what we certainly know is that the size of the data, both in terms of its 3D and its metadata, is going to be massive. And streaming is going to be a huge part of that to be able to disseminate and share this information with all of the different audiences and industries. And as, as a result, game engines are uh, one piece of that puzzle that allow us to bring decades of advancements in game technology and real-time rendering and different types of devices being able to uh, play those games and, in our case, simulations of the geospatial world in real time with the massive scale, with geospatial, and being able to fly from Paris to Sydney without blinking an eye um, in, in these game engines. And with this interoperability, we can go from the web to desktop to mobile and to VR, all with the same data. And that's the crucial thing. Being able to have five different versions of the data, one for VR and one for your mobile and one for your desktop is not the way to scale uh, this this capability. So we we want to make sure that there is um, a core data set that we are all able to work with and can work with all different devices uh, without losing any capability. So that just I'll throw it back to you to share a little bit more yeah. about the work you're doing. Yeah, thanks, Shazam. And so I think Shazam hit some very important points here, right? So there are different aspects of ways this data is going to get consumed and employed in an environment, whether you're simulating or modeling a, a weapon system, a training environment, a disaster scenario, radio signal propagation, whatever the case may be. Um, there are a couple of things that uh, we want to highlight when we talk about the metaverse. And I think Nadine hit the nail on the head when she talked about a system of systems. I think if you think about the the way things used to be done in a simulation environment, you you had the process of building the hardware, designing the um, designing all of the components, all the way up to the learning environment. Everything tightly coupled and and monolithic, and um, we recognize, for example, that more and more in, in especially when we're thinking. Um, towards military applications, you need to be able to bridge different scales from an entire theater where you're concerned about geopolitical boundaries and, and planet scale or continent scale visualizations uh, down to strategic, to operational, all the way down to tactical. Uh, and obviously at the tactical level, you're now concerned with things such as minute details of a single building or characteristics of a structure or an area, but, but there is something in between. And what you see here in front of you is a reconstruction we've done of Paris. Um, this is the La Défense area. And um, 
there are millions and millions of structures and polygons inside um, this image. And one of the things that uh, we work to do is actually uh, manage that level of detail so that um, whoever's building this, um, uh, using this, this, uh, this reconstruction of the planet in a scenario, in a, in a simulation, uh, can abstract those details. So as I said, uh, by having and exposing these um, standardized interfaces, we enable uh, 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 people to focus on their core competency, whether it's simulating radio signals or flight or you know autonomous vehicles, to leverage the capability consistently and scalably. But I'm also going to take you on a bit of a uh, of a journey here, and I'm going to show here an example of a simulation that was built by Microsoft uh, as a demonstration for the U.S. Navy leveraging Black Shark technology and other partners. Um, and in this simulation, um, this is a scenario set around the Spratly Islands. And you'll see there is a blue team and a red team of vessels. Um, and in a traditional simulation environment, each one of these actors was, is managed inside a single application. But in this system of systems, that um, we are working to build and thanks to standards, you can get into a scenario where um, you can leverage geospatial data, you can leverage physics, and each one of these actors, whether it's a blue team or a red team, and whether they are managed by a, a, a person or uh, AI capability, um, they can operate in an independent system and interact with each other. And so the ambition behind creating these open standards is to enable, for example, that um, each one of these actors in a simulation can be itself a single simulation system or actually a system of systems. So imagine if in one of these ships, all of the different subsystems of the ship have their own simulator and you have um, you have the, the the folks on board the ship getting trained in the actual scenario and depending on their actions and reactions um, everybody gets to experience and see and visualize the 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 um, the ripple effect of those actions in the scenario uh, in real time in a large scale environment such as um, uh, such as a, a, a whole theater of operations. So, um, and I think, Shazam, I think you also have an interesting scenario to describe here. You're on mute, by the way. Oops, um, thanks, Castro. Uh, and to to add to everything that you've said, which, which has communicated very effectively, um, there's going to be an ecosystem of standards that power these interactions, immersiveness, interoperability. And these are going to be built by different organizations, not just commercial, but different standard organizations coming together as well. And Neil Trevor, I'm super excited to hear him out, but he's going to be sharing uh, a lot more about this right after this. Um, so one of the more recent examples that I'd like to share was uh, something built by uh, Air Force Research Labs Grill Team, uh, Gaming and Research uh, Innovation Team. Um, and this, what you're seeing on your screen, essentially started at the INDEF Challenge at ITSEC 2021. So bring it full circle here. So the Grill Team built a plugin for Unreal Engine uh, to stream open DIS information uh, from, their, from their systems into the game engine itself. What they did was, they, they they got all of that information, but in the for the geospatial environment, they chose cesium for Unreal, which is which already brings in the entire world into the game engine. So now you have open DIS information coming from one server, you have the geospatial data coming from another server, both combining into Unreal Engine. And now you can uh, plan, simulate, uh, do the operational view, as well as after action review to see um, how the how the simulation went um, in all within one system 
and across different types of devices. So you, uh, you, one of your users could be wearing VR headsets, another could be on a laptop, another one could be on a desktop. So, but being able to bring all of these different standards from different ecosystems into common engines and common runtimes is one of the things that we are looking to enable. And um, just just to add, um, the the Grill Teams OpenDIS plugin is open source, so anybody in in the audience can try it and and check it out how it works. So for my for my last um, message here, what we are going to see is that the metaverse is not just going to be social VR, or it's not going to be only limited to the military. The metaverse is going to apply to a lot of different industries that share a common philosophy of technological innovation that drives new kinds of capabilities, interactions, problem solving, and business processes. Um, for example, this, this image that you have in your screen here is a vision of how the metaverse in terms of collaboration, immersiveness, bringing uh, together different types of content um, into a single environment, along with real-time feeds, uh, sensors from different things. For example, we have sensors from trucks and drones in this scene. Um, can all be applied to a construction and earthworks metaverse in this image. But this is only one type of enterprise use case. What we are going to see is um, events, for example, concerts, or uh, if we if we go to a theme park, you know, being able to be immersed in, in a completely new way, both digitally and physically, that's going to come alive. Uh, industrial metaverses around factories and warehouses and robotics are also going to come online over the next few years. Um, and all of these are going to power really amazing and new types of ways we will all work together, we will train, we will simulate and make the world uh, safer and more efficient uh, through these digital innovations. So with that, um, I'll throw it back to Gaston to share something that they're doing around uh, sensors and simulations as well before handing it over to yeah. you, I believe. Yeah, and yeah, to complement what Shazan just said, um, beyond not just apply to, to military scenarios, but thinking in industrial and or um, commercial uses, I, I'm a huge fan of something that the folks at NVIDIA uh, have adopted as sort of a motto for their uh, Omniverse platform, where they talk about um, the vision is that everything that moves will be autonomous and everything that's autonomous will need to be simulated. I think that's a, that's a very uh, clever way of describing what's ahead of us. And one of the things that, you know, we want to leave you with is the metaverse isn't just about us humans interacting in a modeling and simulation environment. It is also about machines interacting with each other and learning from that environment. And the particular example that you see on screen, we are generating and reconstructing runways and airports all around the world that are currently being used by a major um, aircraft component manufacturer to create better sensors that will aid um, pilots in landing and takeoff scenarios. And so every detail of a runway, the approach plates, the navigational aids is getting placed and reconstructed along with its semantic information so that this can be used in, uh, in a scenario where before even the first flight, um, the sensors and the algorithms can be exposed to uh, to this data and and test it accordingly um and i guess we get to the point where we hand over to neil uh, to talk about how this all comes together everything that we just showed you relies on the fact that there is different layers of of an architecture that need to collaborate and 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 cooperate with each other and that's where neil comes in Thanks, Gustav. Hey, everyone. Um, my name's Neil. Yes, I'm. Um, my day job's at NVIDIA. I'm here, though, really representing the standards community. I'm president of the Kronos Group, which is a standards org, and the Metaverse Standards Forum, which is a very new standards forum, which we'll talk about briefly here. I'll keep it fast because we want to leave time for Q&A. As, as Nadine and others have said, it's hard to have a, a really a coherent top-down definition of the Metaverse. I don't think we should get too hung up on that. I think most people agree it's going to be some mix of connectivity to the web, 
uh, immersive as spatial computing. There's going to be some AI in there, simulation, as Gustav was saying, decentralized ID and transactions. The key thing, I think, uh, about understanding the metaverse in its current form is it's a process where all these technologies are being brought together in novel ways. Um, many ways actually not so unfamiliar to the community here. You know, I, I think you know this community is in many ways has been um, pioneering uh, the metaverse, but there's a lot more energy and types of technologies being brought together in many ways, which I think is going to benefit uh, the, this community here. We're entering a Darwinian bottom-up beautiful process where there's going to be lots of successes and failures, but when technologies are proven and emerge, um, standards are going to play a key role in removing friction points, building commercial opportunities, technical opportunities for everyone. And why is that? What is the secret superpower of a standard? Well, as most people here probably know, uh, a standard enables multiple implementations of a technology. So it can fan out and become pervasive across uh, the industry. A standard is a, basically a specification plus conformance tests. So multiple people can implement for multiple customers, price points, use cases, requirements, geographies, applications. But with the conformance testing uh, regime, make sure that everything is you know, genuinely interoperable. Um, it's different to open source. Open standards and open source often get confused. Open source is the other way around. Open source is focusing multiple implementers on a single implementation, which can be awesome and often the two intermix. But um, you need to know um, uh, to use the right tool at the right time for what you're trying to achieve. And why? Why standards? Well, standards grow markets. It re reduces confusion. It increases capabilities, the networking effect. It reduces costs. You don't have to do everything yourself. You can get faster to market. You have proven technology and uh, testing. And standards enable innovation because the, the boring stuff is standardized and interoperable. It enables any player in the industry uh, to focus on where their differentiation and uniqueness is. When should we create standards? When a technology is proven. We shouldn't do R&D by, by standardization committee. That's not the right way to do it. Wait until everyone understands the technology, everyone's doing it differently in, in an annoying way. It's becoming a friction point. That's the time to standardize. And where? Well, standards organizations you know, for true openness need to be under multi-company government uh, governance with well-defined IPR policies, ideally royalty-free for maximum uh, adoption, um, picking thoughtful abstraction layers to enable the industry whilst not um, uh, stifling uh, innovation. And every platform that aspires to become pervasive you know, needs these open standards. Now, we're using mobile phones and PCs right now. So we're using literally hundreds of open standards uh, to enable this conversation. With so many technologies coming together, the metaverse is going to need a constellation of standards. And no one standards organization, which each standards organization has a particular area of focus, and OGC and Kronos and many, many others. No one standards organization can create all of the standards uh, to enable this new level of interoperability. And that was really the genesis of the Metaverse Standards Forum. Uh, companies coming to Kronos and others saying, we want to use standards. We want to build the Metaverse on an open standards foundation. But it's a really complex landscape. We're having to go around dozens of standards organizations trying to figure out who's doing what, where the interoperability points are, what's working together, what isn't. You know, can't, can't the standards community do better? <laughs> and that is the basic idea of the Metaverse Standards Forum, which is only a few months old. Uh, it's but, but it's a very simple idea. It's a forum where the standards community can cooperate and communicate, communicate, and communicate with the wider industry to make sure we're doing the right thing uh, for the industry's needs. So we've tried to make the forum as open and accessible as possible. There's no participation fee. There's no NDA. Everything is public. Uh, there's no IP framework because we're not another standards organization. That would just make the list of standards organization problem even worse. Uh, so we're this layer of um, uh, cooperation to help the standards organizations with data, support, um, uh, plug fests, interoperabilities, uh, pilot projects, um, to help the standards organizations create better standards sooner. That's, that's the goal. We are not a debate shop. We don't want to debate what the metaverse is. We have Twitter for that. We are focused on uh, very short-term, pragmatic, plug-fest, plug interoperability, pilot project type 
activities that can really move the needle. We like to say we're not trying to design the metaverse cathedral, but we think we can start baking the metaverse bricks that we're going to need to build that cathedral. And that's something that we can do now, and we don't have to, to wait. Uh, we start, we launched back in June, uh, where we had 37 organizations. I was expecting we'd be lucky to get a couple dozen more. We could start doing some good stuff. We're in, set, oh, actually we're in October now, but we have 1,800 companies have joined, which is a surprise, a pleasant surprise to everyone. Uh, it shows, I think, the level of interest and willingness to participate in creating the needed standards for this new level of interoperability that I think we can all uh, benefit from. The, of course, with so many uh, organizations, the challenge becomes how do you make decisions and how do you organize for effective action? So we've adopted a five-step program. Um, we've polled the, the, the membership on what are the key topics that they want, which are the key pain points or the key opportunities they see for interoperability. It's a very interesting exercise. We had over 200 topics. Very naturally started clumping into domains, which are listed here, and we had upvoting uh, for the membership. Um, and we're establishing what we're calling domain working groups to establish working groups to do those short-term pragmatic projects to advance the field in each of those domains. Uh, not so surprising, 3D asset interoperability came up close to the top, as did geospatial um, digital twins, um, or all the things that you'd expect and things that are very relevant to, to this community. Plus, number two was privacy, safety, security, and inclusion, which was very good to see because we need to bake that in at a very fundamental level as we bring all this technology together, else people could easily lose trust uh, in this endeavor if we're not very careful. So that, that's, that's basically uh, it. Um, the, the forum is providing this place where we can coordinate. Any organization is welcome to join. Uh, the forum lets us get lots of broad input from the industry. We have this focused domain working groups to do the work. But once we do work products, you know, we have this captive audience uh, of the forum plus the wider industry. Of course, everything we do is going to be made publicly uh, available. And uh, the link is there in the slide if you want more information. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. That was fabulous. One of the early questions, and I think you did cover it, but I just wanted to highlight it, that came in prior to the webinar was, is it early days to talk about standards when the metaverse technologies are still evolving? I, I believe you answered that, but I just wanted to make sure there weren't any other comments from our panelists, um, because as we discussed previously, how important it is now, yes, the technologies are evolving and have been evolving, uh, but we all agree strongly that the timing is now. And why exactly? Yeah, perhaps I'll just amplify that one point that others chip in. The, the, the metaverse is not going to be delivered to us on our doorstep in 20 years' time. It's starting now. In fact, it's been going on for 30 years, as Nadine was saying. The, the opportunities are now, and the challenges are now. There's going to be a constant stream of opportunity to you know, leverage this in, increased interoperability. We can do stuff today as we you know, take steps down the, the, the path to what the metaverse will eventually be. Yeah, and I think there's an architecture component here, right? I, I, I kind of go back to OSI interoperability models that we had in networking in the early days. And as you agree on this architecture, even though standards may evolve, um, you create a future-proof architecture that you can change standards from one layer of the architecture of another, but um, they still work together um, and evolve together. Well, if I can add, I mean, you should see me. I, I, every time Neil talks, I take notes because he's so articulate on the value of standards. So thank you, Neil. And what I'd like to add is essentially... Uh, look what we're standardizing here. I don't think we're creating new standards. If you look at the top priorities, it's more how can we use what we have, especially when the standards are coming from communities that traditionally didn't talk to each other, like the, you know, the graphics or the geospatial or the building or the transportation. And they're all coming together because Gastau is creating this model for the world. So it's more like how do you connect all these standards and make them work and then how they should evolve because they're not just set in stone. 
Absolutely. Thank you all. Uh, and John Nama, thank you so much, um, has asked a question. What constraints do you see for a successful metaverse? Open. It's not a constraint. I, I, that I should think, be open. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, we, and, and we were just chatting about this before the webinar. I think there's, you know, five big things that came together now at the stage that we're in, ranging from compute power to cloud to pervasive networking and broadband to AI to, uh, you know, the ability to render gorgeous 3D graphics with, you know, high speed. So all of these things are coming together um, in a pervasive and affordable way that, that people can harness. Um, and I think the more applications we start thinking, the more distributed systems, I think the limiting factor is really becoming the ability to inter interoperate. Yeah, I, I agree. The interoperability, I, I do believe, is, is, is key as, as we want to get these technologies to work together. I think there are some dangers. I mean, just not just this community, but the wider community in the, the media which is you know kind of has a feeding frenzy on the term metaverse right now the metaverse term might change but the work will continue the um the dyst you know, the dystopian future worry i think is something that we should you know be careful to push back on i think if we keep focused on real world use cases beyond just people that are going to want to live their lives in the metaverse I, every time someone says that i i cringe that's because no one wants to do that that i kind of um, undermines the value of what we're trying to do here. The uh, the privacy and security aspects are going to be key. You know, people that do want to use an AR VR headset are going to be data mined for all kinds of information way beyond today's social media, and that's a real danger point. So we do need to pay attention to the ethical side of this uh, if it's going to be a pervasive platform. And I think you know, we're seeing. I saw a score the other day, a $25 trillion market forecast but in some finite time. I don't get sucked into all of that overhyping. You know, there's real value here. It's going to be incremental. This, this community has been building lots of the bricks for a long time, and this is just going to accelerate the interest in, in what this community has been doing for a long time. Neil, to add to what you said, uh, and once again, I'll, I'll echo Nadine's comments articulated beautifully. Um, I, I, I've I'd like to add two points here. Um, one, I don't think any of us, either in government or in commercial, should be rushing to figure out how we're going to make money of this thing just yet. Um, I think I think that that's one of the key points you highlighted is just like if you think back to 1995 and where we are today in how we are monetizing um, and creating commercial enterprise value. It's completely different. Like nobody could have imagined that ads would be hundreds of billion dollars of business back in 1995. Um, so I think it's it's important to uh, to understand what the metaverse is going to be, how these enterprise values are going to be created, and then then focus on okay, how do we let's grow the pie first, and then let's figure out what our piece of the pie is, kind of thing. The second thing I'd, I'd like to do, uh, wanted to share was something that takes me back to my days when I was studying for GRE uh, and English, English words and stuff. One of the words, one of my favorite words for the metaverse has become innocuous. Um, innocuous essentially means not harmful to anybody. And, and I think that that really applies here to people from diverse backgrounds and whether that's enterprise or, or social or anything else, being innocuous and not harmful uh, in ways, some ways that the internet has been is is also going to be very important to how we build the metaverse. Can I add to that, Jen, very quickly? Of course. Because I think this brings us back to uh, the use cases, the why. So there is the hype and there's the technology and what we can do. The, but but there's there are some whys that are so strong. So Gustav showed some examples for the military and the simulation. You know, this is not hype. This is, again, real. But I, I take it like, you know, there's no constraint if we use this to help solve climate change or figure out what we can do for climate adaptation worldwide. And that for that, you need the metaverse, however you want to define it, because it's another problem where 
nobody can do it on their own, nobody has the data, et cetera, et cetera. And I think if we if we focus on the the good uses, the whys, I think uh, there's a question on the funding. The funding will come and the support will come because you're solving a real problem out there. Nadine, I think that was spot yeah, on. John actually specifically asked, you know, where is the funding coming from for the military metaverse? Is it a defense budget? Is it a federal government budget? You know, where are these dollars coming from? I think um, uh, my two cents here, based on our interactions, um, their industry there's some degree of research going on in industry right now. There's some companies that are at the forefront of this and, and building out this infrastructure because it is a layered infrastructure that goes from chips to cloud to networking to software infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of investment going on there. Um, the practical applications are a C uh, some, some of those are being pushed by um, the federal government, the Department of Defense and intelligence community, um, as well as, um, you know, partner nations, NATO and, and others. Um, but I also see, to, to Nadine's point, um, there are essentially dual-use technologies that can be used, for example, by... Um, a utility company to visualize and control their production assets and see how their wind turbines are performing, et cetera. And it's a similar construct to visualizing the internet of things and operating in, for example, uh, a weapon system or a theater of operations. So the infrastructure is similar. The application and purpose is different. How these things get built, um, uh, they're going to leverage investment across government and industry to make this successful. Absolutely. Absolutely, Gusto. The only thing that I'll add to that is I am seeing more traditional bids that are being released by federal government and defense that are actually titling these opportunities metaverse um, or digital twins. So I think while a lot of the work has been shaped or maybe named something different, it does fall underneath the metaverse umbrella. And I do strongly believe to Neil's point about 78 trillion, I know I just inflated that number, Neil, uh, but it is quite significant that we will start seeing more and more opportunities along these lines. So there is a question, um, and I believe, Neil, you're answering it, but as we've discussed, the openness, the collaboration, and the interoperability is so key to the metaverse. One of the questions was, how do we define interoperability? Neil, do you mind taking that one? Sure. I mean, interoperability, we, we throw the term around, but yes, it's good to step back and define it. it, it it's just how two things communicate. So it's a precise communication protocol. It can be of many different types. So for example, you have APIs for software to communicate to hardware. You have like OpenGL or Vulkan or something like that. You can have client to server communication. You can even have communication between two organizations. Now, uh, how do two uh, organizations communicate? So it's a very broad term, but it, it, is, it is simply how two things communicate. A good standard only focuses on that communication protocol and doesn't concern itself at all on what's behind the implementation of both sides that need to communicate. I saw another question in there. You know, if so many hands are involved in defining interoperability, how can you know, um, mo more covert services use it? Well, the, the standards don't need to know or care what co covert services may be on either side of that uh, communication channel. The standards just focus on how things communicate in a consistent way. Thank you, Neil. I think that was a great definition. We are actually running up on our time today, but I want to make sure we go around one more time and everybody have an opportunity for that one last hard hitting push or focus if we'd like to share with our audience today. Gesto, why don't we start with you? Well, so we are thrilled to uh, be amongst this um, group of people. Um, we 
we have been working very closely with Cesium, with NVIDIA, with Microsoft, with AWS, with a bunch of other folks uh, to bring this technology forward and make it a reality. I think there are nuggets of opportunity that require um, not just our capabilities, but the, the, the sum of all these capabilities to be um, uh, brought together and we're, we're excited to be a part of it. Thanks, Casto. Maybe? Uh, I'm excited as well. And uh, I would say the message is, please, please, let's not reinvent the wheel. Uh, let's use the foundations that we have. Let's talk to each other. Let's collaborate. Let's interoperate uh, and let's keep it open. It has to be deliberate over time to actually keep it open. That's Absolutely. My Absolutely agree, Nadine. Shazan? Yeah, it's been, it's been a pleasure to be part of uh, this panel here, and I look forward to see all of you at ITSEC for sure. Um, for for us here at Cesium, you know, uh, openness and interoperability has been in our DNA for more than a decade that we've been, you know, first an open source project and then a company. Um, so it's great to see how openness and interoperability are becoming the foundational principles of uh, the future of the internet and the metaverse. Um, we are we are super excited to be you know being able to disseminate the globe and geospatial data to everybody, uh, make it open, bring it to different platforms, including the web and game engines and maybe devices of the future that we haven't even imagined yet. Um, so so yeah, really excited to see what we as uh the the humanity essentially are able to innovate and bring forward what uh, could be a really exciting couple of decades in in our technology perfect shazan and neil so as we said we know many folks here in this community have been working on these kinds of problems for a while this is a real opportunity to grab the energy that the met the, met, the metaverse and the interest that the industry now has and hopefully the you know the investment and with the foundation of interoperability we can all move our goals forward much faster than we could before we hope absolutely agree it is definitely a team effort I want to thank all of you today for joining us. I think this was absolutely brilliant. And I just want us to keep the conversation going. The momentum is now. And I personally look forward to seeing all of you at ITSIC. And with that, Admiral, back to you. Thanks, Shannon. Great job. I, I, I really enjoyed some of these panel sessions because I think the panelists actually talk to each other and, and the forum is not only one where we talk to the audience, but we communicate across different companies about issues. And, and uh, as Nadine said, we, we take some notes. So that's all good. Uh, but thanks, Jen. That was really, really terrific. So um, we, we at NTSA strongly believe that the metaverse will be a hot topic for the next, you know, uh, you know X number of years. And we'll... We'll continue this discussion at ITSIC where we are building our own version of the metaverse, which we call ITSICverse, uh, and it'll be on full display. It's, it's going to be a smaller version, you know, sort of a pilot program. But uh, I've committed with our next big thing committee to actually go forward to create a virtual consortium around the metaverse. And I think, Neil, your group uh, is similar in this, this sort of idea where we, we can bring the companies together that are interested in this area. We did this five years ago uh, with a program we called uh, Operation Blended Warrior, where we brought companies that were interested in LVC and uh, interoperability of simulations. Uh, and we did four years of integration on the show floor. Uh, and I've talked to Bob Kleinhappel and, and Jen about sort of going to the OBW uh, version two, uh, which we would take take this concept, the metaverse, uh, and uh, move it forward in a, in a somewhat of an organized way. And the consortium idea is great because we get companies to, that compete with each other to actually get in the same room and discuss uh, the best way forward. So I'm excited about it. Uh, we are spending a lot of time on it, and I think companies are spending a lot of money on it. So we also want to connect these ideas with programs like the synthetic training environment that the Army is doing. 
They're spending a lot of money on things that are metaverse-like in terms of their synthetic environments. So uh, as always, we're trying to bring government and industry together. Mm-hmm. So with that, I, I just say that our uh, next webinars, the next one is going to be really exciting. It's uh, on the 2nd of November at 11 uh, Eastern. Uh, it'll focus on on perceptions of ITSIC 2022 and expectations by all four service executives. So these are the these are senior executives like uh, Karen Saunders from PEO Strive. We have NOC TSD, uh, PM Traces, and uh, the SIN Center uh, in uh Right, Pat, we'll all be represented. Uh, last time we brought all these people together, we had three or 400 people on online. So it should really be a great one. And you ought to uh, make sure that you tune in for that. The second webinar we're going to have in, in November uh, will be on the 16th. And it's uh, at 11 o'clock. And it'll review some of our NTSA STEM programs and the, the, the whole reorganization of what we're doing in STEM uh, by Linda Brent and her team. And uh, we're going to focus on the CMSP program, the Certified Modeling and Simulation Professional program as kind of a use case inside of that. So that's, uh, that's going to be a fun time as well. So finally, um, ITSIC is really looking great. I just want you to know, if you don't have a room, you better go get once because uh, they we're like at 90% of 16 hotels that are uh, part of our, our block. Uh, the registration rate is well ahead of last year. And we, sh- we sold out the show floor for the second time a couple of weeks ago. So we're, uh, it's, it's going to be epic. I think it could break some records and we're, we're just excited as heck to you know, get everybody back there together. Uh, and so make sure if you're going to go that you go through the, you know, spend some time up front planning your show, figuring out what you want to do, because it is uh, a very complex uh, set of tracks and there, there's just un- unlimited opportunity. So we just want to see you there, have fun uh, and get uh, get with the community. So, again, thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, being here. We thank the panel and we'll see you next time. <laughs>